Uh, to give yes, you a okay. kind of brief introduction <laughs> for those that don't know or need reminding about uh, what the Urban Future Studio is about, I like to describe what we do as um, collectively deconstructing the cultural assumptions that stand in the way of socio-ecological justice and then working with policymakers, artists and activists to collectively construct alternatives. So creating new discourses, new dramaturgies that can uh, bring about a different future. Uh, so today we're lucky enough to hear from Fatima Denton. I'm not going to give a long introduction because in our quirky style, Martin is going to be giving a, a short interview with uh, Fatima before we get started. But uh, for those of you that don't know, she's currently the director of the United Nations University Institute for Natural Resources in Africa, and also the um, since... Hi, Yost. Uh, is it, uh, um, last year, um, since um, September. <laughs> since September, sorry, uh, the yeah. Prince Klaus Chair in uh, Equity and Development at Utrecht University. I wanted to ask people before we get started to um, think about things slightly differently than just a presentation with um, responses <laughs> or, or questions at the end today because uh, Fatima's here for just like two years in, in total and we were already talking today over lunch about uh, how can we make sure that people understand that and make the most of it, uh, both uh, theoretically and practically? How can we uh, build bridges? So I would love it if, while listening today, you thought through things that you would love to learn more about from Fatima, but also if you have ideas of uh, ways of creating further bridges between um, uh, Utrecht University, between uh, the Copernicus Institute and... Um, uh, the broader work that Fatima is doing. So while the team is setting up your talk, uh, let's let's have a brief sort of exchange, uh, allowing everybody a bit more in and into who you are, what your ambitions are here. Um, you're now working in Accra, right? In uh, in, uh, in Ghana, yeah. but you're not originally from uh, Accra. No, I'm not, <laughs> but not far. I'm from the Gambia. The Gambia, the, yes. which is a bit north to the west of, uh, of Ghana. Yes, yes. And apart from sort of the geography, uh, you've, uh, you're you an uh, IPCC author. Mm. How long have you been in the IPCC uh, uh, by now? I'm revealing my age. <laughs> um, I think about 15, between, I'd say 15 to 17 years. Okay. How, the IPCC. how do you feel it's sort of evolving? Or is that in your talk? Uh, no, no. <laughs> Um, how is it evolving in terms of IPCC work? Yeah, you as an expert in that mm. context, being an expert from the Global South, which is something that the mm. IPCC is struggling with. Mm. Yeah, I think um, my first IPCC um, sort of um, interactions, I think were not very positive because I was probably um, the only female in a very kind of male and I think there were some very strong personalities actually in my chapter and I actually felt what am I doing here <laughs> because it was really very difficult um, I felt at the time um, for I think there were there were quite a few things there were quite a few currents I'd say there's there was the sudden aspect um, a researcher from the global south there is the gender aspect um, I was the only woman in that team. Um, and I think that there was some kind of dynamics actually about that group um, that I felt some of the issues around adaptation because we had a very interesting chapter, I would say, which was looking at um, aspects related to climate resilience. Uh, but this was a time when IPCC was also um, I'd say experimenting um, because initially IPCC did some very kind of science-based um, themes um, so, so so issues around oh actually I made a mistake that chapter was about the interrelationship <laughs> now you know who I'm talking about in terms of the strong personalities and character but it was about the inter interrelationships between adaptation and mitigation mm -hmm. So from that perspective, it was rather new. Okay. And IPCC had no experience and, you know, these were the kind of experimental chapters. 
and there were, we, we struggled a bit because we did not have any kind of case study mm -hmm. that was actually talked to issues around interrelationship between adaptation and mitigation. And so some of the relationships that we had experienced or I had experienced um, in my neck of the wood at the time I lived in Senegal, um, I kind of felt I wasn't able to bring to the core <laughs> um, you know, or, or rather to the fore because um, some of the people I was with um, had a very kind of conceptual understanding of these issues. And, and these examples were not conceptual. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was what's interesting. But, but those issues also were seen more like a kind of grey literature kind of thing. Right. And so they were not easy to talk about because IPCC kind of just felt that, OK, um, this is about evidence, evidence, evidence. We're not here to prescribe to policymakers what they should do. Uh, so, yeah, I would say it wasn't, it wasn't an easy entry into the IPCC. For many, for many reasons, I kind of felt, you know, like I, I'm, I'm not supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's something not quite right about these dynamics. But you um, stayed. I stayed. <laughs> is it and is it different now? Hmm. That's a very good question. I think the older me thinks that it's different, but I think a younger me and looking at some of the scientists um, that mm -hmm. are in the group from different parts of the global south. I think they would have to be, I mean, you have to be quite assertive. You have to be very confident. Mm -hmm. You're talking to a number of people that are in this sort of professional academic setting, right? These are people that sometimes are quite loud. They, they, they're not shy. Um, so if you come from Global South and, you know, you're not also used to that kind of contestation in terms of issues, you might find it a little bit unsettling. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, yes, if you are from, the, but then that said, that said, I have seen people from the global south that are equally as loud uh, <laughs> um, within that setting and not afraid to make their points of view. Right. So you, you could have it both ways. But, but I think, yes, I think if you're from the global south, uh, you know, you need to kind of get in uh, make sure you've got your seat belt on and, and be ready for that <laughs> for that ride because um, it's not always easy. Yeah, right. yeah. it's interesting that you, how you say that. That is also expressed in the conceptual language that's constitutional, right, for the mm -hmm. working groups and what they're supposed to do. And there you find yourself at odds with what you want to say and think you know, right? Mm -hmm. so, but I thought your inaugural was really uh, really profound on that. Right? So the whole idea how that logic works against mm. understandings that you think should be brought to the situation of Africa mm. when it comes to climate adaptation. But people can read that and I hope actually it's going to be available online. I thought it was a really powerful uh, speech. So uh, thanks for that once again. And and but so what, what Tim said, I thought this is one of those points where I think we should explore to what extent Utrecht can be a hub for that sort of conversation. And oh, yeah. Bart van der Herk is, of course, now co-chair oh. of Working Group 2. And he's, I think he's really open to understand these sort of things. So quite a few IPCC also, also in this building that, that may want to relate and we may stage that. I think that would be oh. really interesting to see if we can built on that sort of transformative capacity that we have uh, right. as colleagues. But uh, Okay, so um, that that's your IPCC hat, uh, um, but you're going to talk about what? <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about a topic I seem to be talking about quite a lot these days, uh, which is around... Um, I mean, I'm using the word redirecting the pathway about just transitions. And the, the, the fact of the matter is that this is now very much of a popular parlance. Everyone's talking about a just transition. Um, I don't think we know exactly where we're headed with this transition. Um, and I start on a very positive note with this. Uh, because I, I kind of feel that that's the way to go. Um, and recently, some of you would have followed the event, uh, the African Climate Week in Kenya, where um, the, the president of Kenya, uh, William Ruto, 
um, had some very kind of audacious, you know, kind of talk. He was very bold about some of the things that he thinks Africa could deliver on. And I kind of felt envious a little bit. <laughs> I felt like, okay, people like him are allowed <laughs> to be so bold. And people like myself have had this kind of opportunity narrative of being kind of bold. Africa is able to deliver on this. Africa can do this. Africa, and we're not heard. So, so some, somehow I wish I was the head of state for perhaps a day or a week <laughs> um, to have that kind of bold um, sense of um, how things are going to go. But yes, so the, the idea is looking at um, just transition, which doesn't come with, um, you know, it doesn't come with a map. Um, and um, I feel at the moment the, the world is in a pretty grim place. You know, there are so many things that are happening um, on a daily basis. Um, and I think that that sort of, um, how should I say it? It's almost like a, it, it's a very manifest vulnerability, actually. It's not, it's not a latent one. It's a very manifest vulnerability. And, and it speaks to this sort of um, humanity that, that all of us are in this together. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would emphasize a bit on the African side because I'm, I'm sort of coming with that vantage points. The policymakers I talk to come from that perspective. The research that I do is very much imprinted on this sort of African, you know, uh, I'd say dynamics. Um, but at the same time, um, this is a continent um, that um, is going to bear quite a big part of the responsibility mm -hmm. um, of cleaning up uh, with, with a very little carbon footprint, um, barely 4%. And so therefore, I've always felt that this, this continent um, is, is actually in solidarity with the rest of the world <laughs> uh, because of this 4% mm -hmm. compared to the rest of the world. So it could basically just sort of close in on itself and say, we're fine, <laughs> you know. Uh, we need these things. And it's that sort of, you know, a phrase that I hear quite a lot, the right to development, which India uses quite a lot. And it can argue that because it's, um, as I said in my presentation, it's probably the region that is the poorest in terms of energy security. Um, but at the same time, it is not able to do that or doesn't want to do that because it feels that um, not only is it going to be impacted by climate, imp by climate um, impacts, rather, but at the same time, it feels that Africa has always been part of the rest of the world and cannot afford to be isolated from what others are doing. So, so in a way, my, my words are chosen um, I, I prefer to talk about a redirection. Um, I f prefer to talk about a reconfiguration. Um, and I, I, I prefer also to basically say that um, we, all of us need to get on course because none of us have a, you know, none of us have a kind of a GPS <laughs> that tells us when to turn right or left or how we go. Um, th this hasn't been done before. But I feel, and that's why I'm confident, I feel that Africa is in a very enviable position because a lot of what it needs, or, or a lot of what the rest of the world needs, and that's a statement I make quite a lot, is already in the continent. Mm -hmm. now, now the difficulties is how it can sort of take it and, and lead the way. So maybe before Fatima starts talking, actually, I wondered, um, are there any questions people already had that they'd like to pose to her without necessarily providing an answer. Maybe, maybe they'll be answered through the, the talk itself. Um, so my, my name is Joost de Laat. I'm a professor of economics and uh, part of the Center for Global Challenges and, and uh, support to Fatima. <laughs> um, uh, I, my question to you is, is uh, um, and now we're so used in the last uh, year, two years, three years, depending on the, around the term just transition, although, you know, talking about what it means in practice, but uh, at, at what point in time did you yourself think, hey, you know, we need to connect these, these, these two, the, 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 the discussion around uh, uh, transitioning and, 
and, and issues of, of development and justice and in, mm. in like at what point did that emerge in, in, in your own thinking and, and as something that you thought, hey, that's something that I mm. want to generate discussion around. Yeah. I mean, I think if I'm honest, I'd say that these issues were never sort of divorced from each other because to a large extent, um, the transition cannot happen without that sort of equity element, which is what just transition is about. Um, and once you start talking about equity, you are now at the heart of the sort of development imperative, right? You're now talking about the need for food security. You're now talking about the need for water security. So, so for me, um, you know, I mean, it's interesting you ask that question because I'd say some couple of months ago, I was invited to um, talk to um, Danish um, development um, officials. But I think there was, the, there was a minister from Denmark um, that was like a climate minister. Now I think he's in a sort of like international development or corporation. And perhaps I'm getting it wrong. But anyway, there was a, there was a key ministry that's responsible for these issues. And the topic of the conversation was around um, climate change and sustainable development. And I kind of felt that we were like, you know, streets ahead of you guys because, I mean, in Africa, there's, there's no sort of sense of, you know, sweeping one part into a kind of nice, tidy area and then leaving the other. These two are so closely um, related. So in a way, I felt um, this this discussion is somewhat stale because most people and government officials and even the man in the street would not tell you that these things are separated. Uh, because, and, and I think that's what's interesting um, about this topic. Um, the development implications for Africa is so huge. Um, and... It's, it's first and foremost about development, you know. And, and, and so when people neatly see this as an environmental problem, uh, environment is development in that part of the world. Because what you do in a river basin, what you do with land that is probably degraded has huge implications for, um, you know, for food security, for water security, for energy security because Africa has always been very dependent on its um, natural resources. Um, so, yeah, so in a way, um, I think the, these terms, are, you know, they, 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 they're terms that we have to deal with, and the, the whole climate narrative is replete with um, terms like this. But in many ways, I feel that, um, you know, they, they, they're very closely related. I, I was reminded of the discussion I used to have in the energy science um, group uh, about that it's um, so just a little side step, that it's it's quite expensive to get off the natural gas in the Netherlands, mm. um, but it's actually the most expensive is to be the last person to get off the gas grid because the cost of the gas grid are paid by everyone, mm. and if you're on the last person to convert your fuck because you. You can't afford to get get the heat pump. You can't afford, mm. um, but you can't afford to pay for the whole gas grid by yourself. Mm. So in that way, I, I kind of I was a little triggered by your suggestion that uh, or by what you said that that Africa is doesn't need to tran to transition. That it's fine the way it is because isn't Africa also pushed by the divestment in the rest of the world because mm. Africa cannot mm. sustain the fossil economy on its own, right? Mm. Yeah, let me qualify that statement, actually. Um, yes, Africa, um, like I said initially, um, is part of the world. It, it has to transition, but it doesn't have a transition legacy compared to the other continents. Um, if you want to transition here, you would have to look at ways in which you could retrofit some of your systems in place that were already configured um, to, you know, um, basically oil, gas and all of that. But that infrastructure hasn't actually, I mean, apart from South Africa, it's not an infrastructure you find in the hydrocarbon-rich countries in Africa. So the infrastructure is not there. So that legacy 
um, that others have, that, that now they would have to retrofit and customize, is not in Africa. And that's why it seems to have this very smooth sort of terrain where you can just kind of, and that's why people talk more about leapfrogging. And I often actually talk about, talk about how important it is for Africa to avoid emissions. It, it's not so much for me about emissions reductions. It's, it's how you stay on the course of avoidance of emissions. So in that way, I would say, yes, um, um, there's no transition legacy. But it doesn't mean that it, Africa shouldn't be part of the transition. I mean, we're in a de facto transition, whether we like it or not. And, and the point about, um, I think what you were saying regarding um, um, gas and all of that, I think it's, it's dawned on many countries in Africa. And if you talk to co policymakers and, you know, they're not shy to say this, it's, it's going to take a number of years. You know, some would even say 20 to 30 years because the, the process of getting a gas infrastructure in place, it's a long one, you know, that, that has all of these things around the safety of it, around transmission, you know, around how you bottle the gas and all of that. The, 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 um, the, even in terms of the, the value chain of how that is going to work, it's not fully in place yet. Um, so, so you have countries where they have like a recycling and, you know, a refilling rather um, um, infrastructure, but they're very few. Um, so that's, that's probably one of the reasons why it should become some sort of a disincentive to say, this might not be something you need, because if it's going to take you this long length of time, and there's, there's a sense that these resources will become stranded. Why would you want to get into this, you know? And, and that's a more powerful argument than one which is aiming to patronize the rest of Africa by saying, you don't need this. Because often policymakers listen to that, but with a great deal of suspicion. It's like, you know, are you infantilizing us by telling us we don't need this when you have had that same privilege and has gone that, down that road. So I think it's better to point to some of what might be unintended uh, um, consequences, some of the things that might be risk uh, or related to a particular risk of you know, having an infrastructure that then becomes some sort of an ivory tower that you don't use, rather than saying you can't go down that pathway. Because I think that phrase is often very much uh, rejected. I will try to, to go through this very quickly. I, I did mention that I just, because uh, in my IPCC, IPCC sort of space, there's a lot of talk about shifting development pathways. And I've often asked myself this terminology, what does it mean? But there is a sense that you can actually um, configure your development pathway based on your sustainable development goals. That you can look at those goals and basically say, this is what we want to go to, where we want to get to, and, and start redirecting that pathway in a way that would help you become more um, climate resilient. And as I said, the pathway is something that we're all asking ourselves about, where, where is it? If I had to do this in terms of a storyline, I would basically just talk about the future of Africa in terms of a carbon future. And I'll talk about how bright that is. And I'll give you some examples of why I think it's bright. But I would also maybe um, temper that a little bit by saying that that brightness is actually dimmed because of the current context. Um, and I'd also say that for us to kind of aim for a future that is a kind of climate resilient future, we have, there are some things that we can't do in the same way that we've done. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, a story, a story lined out like to duck in those sort of three categories of um, ideas. Um, Having said that the future of Africa is bright, I want to also just say that for me, when we talk about a, a, a development pathway, we have to bear in mind that there's no single trajectory. Initially, I was talking about this idea of not having a roadmap. 
um, and I mean that that's part of the theme of this um, um, of this event, um, you know, road mapping Africa's future. Um, but I do have a tendency sometimes that when we talk about a resilient future or carbon neutral future, we, we sometimes have the tendency to oversimplify the story. So I did want to make that point very clear and I can go into further details later. Um, I also want to basically say that um, even as we are talking about how can we get to um, a carbon future, we still have to recognize that the dominant um, energy choices are, are very far away removed from the, the ones that we, we, we basically talk about. So there is, a, there, is a, there is a very kind of vocal sense of we need to go towards renewable, we need to go towards hydrogen and all of that. But in reality, once you start looking at investments, once you start looking at what's been traded between countries, when you see oil pipelines that are being built, basically, you then have a sense that we are still very far removed from what, is, what seems to be an aspiration. You know, even with the Paris um, Agreement, that's not actually registered yet in our, in our way of doing things, right? I think for me, the one that sits even well, uh, um, better, in my thinking and in the experiences that I've had talking to policymakers is just how ill-prepared we are for this transition. Because as I said, it's a very complicated process, but we are also not quite ready. And, and some of what we say and some of what we do in reality does speak to the fact that we're not quite ready. So I think there's, there's a whole mindset and behavior that needs to also follow. So it's not about just standing at the COP, which is our big event of talking about what commitments you're going to make. It's also that you see this also in Africa. It's also when African countries go to these big events and they commit to doing things in a certain way, um, in line, I guess, in solidarity um, with the rest of the world, but then they're back home and then they are also thinking about their oil pipes and gas pipes and signing contracts and agreements. So that sort of sits, um, it's a little bit of contradictions in terms, um, if you think about it. And then the other thing now is that this whole climate um, talk um, and this push towards a net zero is becoming very market based. You know, the market seems to have now, the, it's, it's like the key lever. You know, uh, uh, people talk a lot about um, carbon markets and people are actually looking for those markets. And if you go to a typical conference, you will be surprised at how much of the talk is around carbon markets, right? And I always remember a quote from... Um, Meles Zenawi, who was asked at one stage, because to me, and I, I, I cite him a lot, um, and one would think that there's some kind of a love affair between me and Meles Zenawi, although he's no longer of this world. But the reason why I cite him a lot is because he was very visionary about what Africa needed. And he was one of the first people um, at least of his generation, that started talking about the need for a green future. And he recognized that this was a pathway that Africa needed to be on. And he, 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 he made sure that his government was designed um, in a way, de their development plan was designed in a, in a way that he was actually speaking to this green future. They, there's not a single minister in Ethiopia that would stand in any platform and not talk to you about a carbon resilient green pathway, you know, because um, a green economy, CIG, because that's what's they, they all, that, that was part of their, um, that was part of what they do. So, so, so Meles and I, when, when he was asked about this at, at, at um, some years ago, when this whole green development was actually quite novel, um, he actually did say, 
talking about it and asking countries about technology or infrastructure, because most of the time there's a sense that you have to have the infrastructure in place. It's almost conditional. So if you want to go green, if you want to do this, these are things you want to, you need to have. So the, the idea of competition uh, has been introduced into the debate in terms of how you can address the climate change problem. And he blames that on a neoliberal economy that he feels has got us in this problem. You know, the competition is about putting neoliberalism in, at the heart of the, the, the solution. And so now looking to that very neoliberalism that is part of the problem for the solution, he felt wasn't the right way to go. Right. Um, the other part of why there are many shades of gray is because of the fact that Again, I mentioned the example of African countries and leaders that go to a particular part of the world and talk about what they're going to do, their, their commitments. But at the same time, some of the most vocal countries in the North do have their oil companies um, that are basically migrating their dirty industries to other parts of Africa. Right? And still, as they talk about we're going to reduce this amount of emissions. We're going to reduce that amount of emissions. You know, those companies are there. Those multilateral, um, um, multinational companies are there. And in a way, um, the commitments that their countries have taken doesn't seem to sync with some of the actions that they're doing in countries where they need to probably help those countries get investments, move towards renewable energy, um, being able to support the renewable energy goals, but that's not happening. Um, and the, 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 the other part of it is that um, there is still an irony or, or a contradiction, a paradox in all of this, in that this continent, as rich as it is in all of these resources, is actually not fully dependent on itself, right? It needs others. So much of what Africa produces um, in terms of all these resources we talk about, oil and gas, are not utilized by the majority of people in Africa. So it's still very much um, a continent that is almost wired, <laughs> um, designed to export, right? So there is a need for a more strategic way of thinking about how we can use its resources beyond exports. Because if you have these resources and you're rich and then your people are energy poor, what does that say about the whole governance framework? Um, and, and I think that in a, in, a, in a way, and I also did not just want to talk about energy, I also want to talk a little bit about the fact that it's not, when we talk about that transition, we often put energy because energy is the predominant narrative that most countries in the North see their emissions have to be reduced. So when their emissions have to be re reduced, they think about it in terms of energy. But the food systems, the cities, are equally important to countries in the South, right? Because this is about survival. Uh, but the North is very much um, on that sort of trajectory of energy, energy, energy. And that's because, to a large extent, the global South does not control the narrative. The narrative has been controlled by the global North, whether we like it or not. Fatima, is, is it okay to ask or...? Very okay, very okay. Uh, I was wondering, so Africa is immensely diverse. Mm. Uh, and Africa can talk about continents, let's say, and not about the, yes. the huge differences you... Well, there are yes. countries between places, etc. Yes. So is that also not a reason why there are so many pathways, let's say, to the transition? Yes. Process? Yes, absolutely right. And, and you're so right, because I think it's, it's, probably, <laughs> it's probably a tendency that we do, that I do, and, and probably it's not, the, it's not the right way to go about it, because um, it's convenient, but it doesn't always help. In West Africa alone, I, I mean, I talk about the fact that energy in itself is not evenly distributed. Um, you'd find that in, if you're talking about investment, uh, many countries in Africa have very little investment in terms of energy. But when you look at South Africa, it's sort of way ahead. Um, when you look at North Africa, those countries are way ahead. So the energy needs, the energy priorities 
can, uh, sometimes are quite dissimilar. So we can't we can't generalize um, in the way that I've done. Um, but sometimes the generalization comes from the fact that the predominant number of countries are still, you know, energy poor and they're still struggling. Um, one of the reasons why I talked about the, the, the brightness of Africa and the fact that this is a continent that can actually take the lead in terms of carbon resilient um, development is because of the fact that it has a very low um, 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 carbon footprint. And I was talking earlier about that need that it doesn't need to have that sort of legacy um, um, infrastructure because it has no legacy infrastructure because those emissions have not been taken advantage. You know, it, Africa hasn't drawn on that carbon budget that is almost three quarters depleted. So it doesn't have that problem. And there's also the fact that, you know, some of these are aces really, because when you think about it in terms of the Congo Basin being, you know, the world's second largest rainforest and what that can do in terms of carbon sequestration is also very, a very strong potential. Um, it's a known fact now. We talk, we're all very excited about these green minerals, but it's a known fact. And these minerals have not been, they, they weren't discovered yesterday. But the fact is that we've, re, we've, we've realized that for us to scale up in terms of renewable, those minerals will be essential. And that's why we're talking about critical green minerals. Um, and we're also talking about an industrial revolution, you know, fourth industrial revolution. And one study that we did revealed that 46 out of the 66 minerals um, that will be essential for the um, industrial revolution are already home to Africa. You know? so, so in a way, the, the continent has a lot of what it needs or what the world needs to be able to kind of get to um, a, clean, a cleaner development. Um, the leapfrogging is, is important because there's also a sense that the rest of the world, the demand for clean energy is going to come from the global south, right? So the rest of the world, um, especially the north, would need a lot of these resources and some of which they don't have, um, will then need to look towards countries like Africa to be able to sort of, and that's already happening. In the case of hydrogen, you can see from with Namibia, South Africa, those situations are already happening. So the continent does have that ability to kind of leapfrog and to move away from current dirty um, um, industries. Um, there is also the fact that this is a continent of immense land, arable land, um, and that is also something that can be exploited um, in terms of carbon sequestration, but also in terms of um, large scale adaptation. Um, the research infrastructure um, is not fully developed. Um, Africa doesn't spend a lot of monies um, on research. Um, so if you were looking for terrain where you can actually say, okay, let's go in and let's put in the research um, infrastructure, this would be like a ready-made place where you can go and dock in. Um, and then there's also the element of um, the, the aspect of hydrogen I talked about, which is already a pipeline that's waiting to be taken advantage of. Um, and we're seeing that, as I mentioned, in a couple of countries. Um, Namibia, for instance, has announced a 9.4 billion um, green hydrogen project, um, which they're already busy with. Um, and then there's the trade element, which is often maybe left on the sidelines. I mean, the trade is actually quite important. I talked about markets, uh, but, but how countries can trade between themselves using some of these resources um, is essential. And the fact that Africa has got these, the African continent free trade area. Just a drop of water. Um, that in itself is, um, you know, it's, it's quite exciting because the AFCFTA is actually one of the largest trading blocks, blocks in the world because it's connecting um, that many people. Um, and obviously the population of Africa is going to increase um, by 2050. So in terms of, um, um, a, if, you, if you're thinking about what will connect people together, that... Um, 
this initiative, I think, has got a very strong potential. Uh, 1.3 billion people, there is also potential that it could lift 30 million people out of poverty. Um, and in terms of GDP, uh, we're looking at um, 3.4 um, trillion um, dollars overall collectively. So, so here is, um, um, these are all reasons why one should be excited. Um, these are points I already mentioned, so I probably won't go into them. But I want to just talk about the point about redynamizing local economy, because I think that that's important. In this whole debate and discussions around how we get to a, a um, carbon future that you know basically severs ties with what we have now, we can't do that if we don't do something about local economy. Um, so there is a very important aspect of local innovation that we need to give priority to. Um, if we, if, we, if we sort of wait for things to come and things coming from elsewhere, then we are basically um, not taking advantage of some of the potential that the continent has. And, and the continent has got a youth potential. The continent also basically, um, as, as, you, as you know, is, is um, a continent that has shown great innovation. Um, so that innovation, we actually need to drive us out of the current stage um, that we find ourselves in and to uh, a carbon neutral future. And that cannot happen if you don't test local people. And that's why I often very much talk about the informal sector, because that's not a sector that is plugged into the formal economy. But a lot of the innovation lies in that informality. And so how we draw from that and how we test them. Um, is going to become very um, essential. Um, this was just basically also talking about another ACE that a continent has, which is around renewable energy um, and the very fact that in all its diverse forms, um, Africa does have a huge share um, of renewable energy. We, uh, I mean, I should say that there's still a problem related to um, the deployment and the penetration of renewable energy. But that said, um, it's also quite essential that there are wide, um, um, a wide array of different types of renewable energy. And that's what most, um, most countries are looking for as a way out um, of the current um, fossil fuel um, conundrum. Um, yeah. What, what, what is driving that renewable energy? Uh, which, which sources? Like solar, uh, yes. Uh, yes, and again, just to emphasize the point that the, the gentleman made, um, the renewable energy that we have are not also evenly distributed. In some regions and in some countries, you have one aspect of renewable energy, and in others, like in Kenya, you know, there's a lot of geothermal. Um, in Ghana, for instance, they are um, using a lot of um, hydro. Um, and relying on hydro. Uh, you have countries like um, Mauritania um, that have also been very sort of almost like a mini revolution. They're pushing, um, you know, putting a lot of um, energies into solar um, and have actually gotten quite far. In other countries like um, um, Cape Verde, um, it's um, wind energy. So, so you have all these diverse forms of energy, um, and and they're all in they're all in Africa, um, and different countries are pushing forward. Many countries have got quite advanced policies already um, on on these renewable energies. It, it used to be um, like in the past, like a really large reliance on traditional biomass, or at least that's what I heard. So you're telling yeah. me that, that that has changed. No, it hasn't changed. Um, the, the, Biomass is still quite dominant. It's still a dominant fossil fuel. Uh, but I think that many countries in Africa recognize that unless they start also working on improved biomass, which is part of many countries' development plan, but the fact still remains that the ambition to move to renewable energy um, is, is actually greater. Uh, but in actual practice, I mean, in practice, it hasn't happened. So biomass, you'll find people who can't afford 
Um, you know, I, I mean, I live in Ghana and I was always surprised because when I lived in Senegal, to, to, there was a lot of promotion around li liquefied petroleum gas and it was actually subsidized. And we found that in, in the case of Senegal, the subsidy was actually benefiting um, people um, that are in urban areas and, and people in the rural areas were probably not getting much from the subsidies because by the time you take the gas to the rural areas, the cost of transport, it meant that they were paying more than the urban dwellers. Um, so there was something that was not very good about the, the way that subsidy was, was done. So, so to some extent, it did not displace um, you know, biomass and it stayed on for a long time and government had to find other ways of, of doing that. And I think that the, the vast majority of people, especially in the rural areas, would still use bio biomass in Senegal. I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the importance of just getting a sense of how this evolution of just transition is moving. Um, recognizing, as we've said, that yes, there's, there's a great future and that future is made up of renewable energies, a strong potential, a trading, um, uh, a trade lever uh, with the AFCFTA that can be pulled. But at the same time, uh, this has to happen within that space of equity. And in that space of equity, you know, we need to understand what we mean by just transition. Um, so this, this terminology is still evolving to a large extent. Um, and it, it, it emphasizes the importance of respect and dignity. It's, it's really about how you take people away from potential implications of being in a heavy, you know, carbon intensive industry, right? And if you move the transition um, so that those industries do not exist anymore, those people are going to find themselves um, compromised. So it's how you recognize that sense of, you know, um, basically the jobs that they might lose, how you recognize that that loss of jobs might also come with some, you know, the, the, the kind of social protection that they might need. Those things are what just transition is about. So it's building into the issue of equity or the transition itself, some of um, the aspects of fairness, the aspects of justice, the aspects of how you democratize the process. So people that are basically trying to move away from this are not left um, penalized. But in as much as we recognize the brightness, as I mentioned before, there are still some contradictions. And some of those contradictions around a question, some a question that I hear very much, is about an orderly transition, and and sometimes I wonder how how can a transition be orderly, because we don't know what we're going to have. We're still going to experiment. So for me, those two sets of words do not quite sit well together. Um, the fact also that we need to configure our economies. Some people argue that the more we grow, the more we're going to basically be emitting um, um, fossil fuel. And so should we then temper that growth? You know, and what would, we, what would it look like? So there's a whole school of thought around the whole discussion around degrowth or how you can basically um, talk more about climate capitalism. Um, so that's another discussion. There's a discussion around the leapfrogging aspect, which I've talked about. Um, and there's a fact also that there's a, there's a sense that this transition and the injustices around the transition can actually hold the process back, right? Um, and that's a very strong sense. And I just also wanted to mention that sometimes the reason why the just transition doesn't sit well in some parts of the world is because of the origins of just transition. So this terminology was born in the, U in the US, um, especially in the 70s, and it was very much around issues of protection of jobs. Right? Um, and it was in a way a shorthand, as I said, for moving workers away from carbon intensive industries. But at the same time, when you take a just transition to a context of Africa, People don't see that sort of genealogy. They don't see that trail of where it, where it comes from, that fight, that labor aspect. And they see it as a bigger problem than just labor, 
right? Because just transition has other implications for economies in Africa. Um, so the historical context is often overlooked. Um, and I, I just use this um, quote, um, quote basically where um, somebody was basically saying that this is now becoming a, a concern when big greens and others are using the term and getting funded for using the term. It becomes the term du jour for foundations and those frontline communities become objectified. So, so we want to just pay some attention to the fact that the people that are mostly affected by this are now being almost, you know, instrumentalized. Um, the, the, the popularization of just transition, and Jos know this, knows this because, and, and Thelma, we, we're thinking about within the, the course of the Prince Klaus um, chair and what's left of it, um, how do you take this very elite notion of just transition? Because to some extent it's become a bit elite. How do you rid it of its elite um, features and give it grassroots, right? Um, and, and that comes in how you popularize it. And there's a sense that the people in the US that have been talking about just transition have had a very long and hard struggle. You know, so it didn't just come. It was something that they fought for. But most of us, and I think I'm not probably um, out of that um, category, when we talk about it, we don't tend to associate it with that history of the US and the labor movement. Because when, you, when I bring that history to the context of Africa, they don't rhyme, they don't sit well together. Um, so I need to find a context that would basically help African officials, or at least make them think about what they want out of just transition. You know? So they need to begin to start defining it for themselves rather than think about it in terms of a terms, terminology that started somewhere else. Um, so there is a talk that the more you reject the labor aspect of it, the more you are dehistoricizing the debate, right? Because you're taking it out of what it was and you're giving it something else and you're not recognizing some of the, the struggle that comes with it um, and as, as the, the, you know, the roots that comes with it and also some of the subversive um, potential that it comes with. So we need to be a little bit careful about not doing that. Um, and that's why we talk a lot about the need to democratize the transition. That that democratization of the transition would happen in, in a space like this, where we sit and we deliberately say, how do we do this? It happens with people. It doesn't necessarily happen with governments. It happens with people. It happens with civil society. Um, but it means that we need a kind of multi-stakeholder group that would sit and say, these are the things that I'm concerned about the transition, and this is what I would like to change. So that deliberative democracy um, is what we need to give it that um, sense of um, context um, if we want to sort of not consider the history about it. And, and these are all the different aspects, and I know you... You, you know this already, but I just sort of added this slide as to say there are so many slices of justice when you talk about just transition, you know, whether it's distributive justice in terms of ensuring that you're asking for a fairer share of both the burdens and the opportunities as well. And, and it's not all about burden. There are opportunities. Um, the procedure of it to make sure that you're not ignoring the demand of vulnerable groups and what they want out of it, you know. Um, and also recognizing that, you know, local indigenous people matter in this. So how you give them that sort of restorative justice, you recognize their present condition and the history that comes with maybe being dispossessed um, is equally important um, if you want to restore justice. And these are just... Um, a, a table to show that these are the things that matter. Um, the notion of damage and exposure is very important when we think about just transition, uh, because there's a real aspect of people being exposed. Uh, you hear a lot about the loss and damage, and people will be displaced, uh, properties will be lost. There, there is no such thing as insurance, or the insurance culture in some part of the world is not as developed as what you will have here. Um, so that ability, to, and, and this for me is the essence of resilience. Resilience for me has these three components. It's your ability to cope, your ability to recover, 
but it's your ability to recover and to create something different from that recovery. And, and that's what I think a lot of countries in Africa need to start thinking about. That, that yes, it's essential to reduce emissions, but it's fundamentally essential to build that resilience muscle in a continent like Africa so that they can just, the people in Mozambique, if they're hit by some kind of a storm or a flood, they would know exactly how they can find that recovery. They would recover. They would, I mean, if you compare the same situation, if it happened in the Netherlands, they could recover, I, I wouldn't say overnight, but they would recover faster than if you, come, if you transpose that same situation in Mozambique, it would take much longer. So I think the, 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 the trick is finding how people can be um, empowered and given the relevant tools, whether this is about networks, kinship, family, uh, but th they need a support system to be able to recover fast. So the hazards are coming and they're not, they, 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 they don't, you know, um, they don't care about boundaries. Um, so the hazards can, can occur anywhere. Extreme events are extremely um, frequent these days. But um, the, the threshold of um, how people might be able to now process this, recover from it, is what is becoming very difficult. Um, these were just some examples of um, just transitions um, policies that we're seeing. Um, I also wanted to talk about a few things here and then I'll try to make it shorter so that I'm not speaking too much and we can have a conversation. When I hear the word roadmap, it, it makes me a bit anxious <laughs> because it's also, in as much as it's helpful, we can't stagger into a transition. We have to plan for it. Um, and we talk a lot about that in my organization. But we also have to remember that we are in a continent, and, and I'm now generalizing, but generalizing based on some of the historical precedents. We're in a continent that doesn't necessarily follow plans. You know, plans are made, right? They are assiduously made. You'll find one plan after another and another. But the continent doesn't necessarily, they had some very good plans, a Lagos plan of action, all of those things. They're not followed. The implementation rate of some of these historical documents is quite poor. Um, what you mentioned um, is actually true in the sense that there is a diversity in the needs and circumstances. Um, you can't take a country like the Gambia and then compare that to South Africa. They sort of, you know, um, diametrically op um, opposed and different. Um, one thing that many countries have, which is going to dim the light further, is the fact that they have heavy debt burden. And, you know, the world is now talking, at least the UN is talking about it, the need to think about the debt infrastructure and to question the Bretton Woods institution and basically say, is this um, um, fit for purpose? And, and as they do that, the, the, the countries in, in, in Africa are still left with this um, huge debt burden, which they have to service, right? Um, and sometimes the debt would last for a whole lifetime. So how they get themselves out of that would affect their climate action. Because how are you going to go and procure technologies that would support climate action if you're in debt. It means that you'll be in debt twice because you're going to have to go and talk to the Chinese government or you're going to have to talk to the British government. But those are the people that you're actually, you're, 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 you're indebted to those people. So, so, so I think there is, a, there is a double exposure that countries in Africa face because of this heavy debt burden that they have. And it does reduce um, their... Um, um, their ability to be fully part of that um, climate action. So they, they may not have all the tools they need. Um, to also just say that the, the continent has been very much on a path dependency. So for me, part of the logic of, of moving out of this is to say that path dependency is not good for the continent. You know, um, path dependency will not enable the continent to diversify its resources and we would keep the continent in dependence for a long time. So how they get out of that kind of colonial mode and how they kind of basically um, find ways of diversifying their economies is going to be essential. 
So that, for me, is very important. And the fact is that there is a sense that multinationals still have a stranglehold on the resources in Africa. You know, I remember somebody uh, making the statement that uh, we're colonized by private corporations. So multinationals can come in and decide on contracts. Now, it's not, a, it's not as if this is a, an, an innocent Africa is the victim, because it's often done, um, I would say, with an elite um, that also want to take advantage of resources. Um, we found, uh, when I was at ECA at least, that over 90, and I think the figure might have gone up, but over $90 billion a year is lost to illicit financial flows, right? So, so capital flight is a big problem. So we, we can't just basically say, okay, com companies are coming and they just, um, um, they have, a, they have a, some intelligence um, about what the market is going to do. So they write contracts or they sign contracts based on that advanced knowledge that they have. But they're also talking to an African elite um, that also sees that they can take advantage of the, of the situation. And these are just aspects of injustice that I mentioned before, which um, I'm not going to, going to go into a lot of detail. But it's just to give you that sort of disparity that if we have extreme poverty, and I think yours was asking about the development and justice. For me, this slide tells you that story that you can't, um, you can't uh, basically put justice in one bag and, um, and um, development in another, or you can't put climate in one bag and then development, and they, they are so closely related um, that you can't do that. Um, some of these I've already talked about because I think for me, um, as long as we haven't re resolved the whole issue around climate justice, uh, we will not go far enough in terms of the transition because those two things are very much related. Um, I think also that um, the, the climate justice aspect in itself, if you deny that, if you, if you don't realize that this is a very intangible but big beast that needs to be addressed, then I think we will take much longer to get the transition right. Uh, because the, the justice doesn't talk to you, but it is there. It's something that you have to acknowledge. Um, and fundamentally, I think there's also the aspect of power and power symmetries. And that's, that's also a big part of the problem. Um, the reason why the, the development part cannot, come, cannot be left out is it, very much around this quote, which um, somebody we were interviewing mentioned. And, and he basically says, Africa is going to have a green development pathway. It cannot come at the cost of re re uh, reducing poverty and meeting the basic needs of people in Africa. So that is non-negotiable. Right? So when Akufo Ado goes and talks about uh, his resources, I mean, Ghana's resources, <laughs> rather not his resources, he talks about it more in terms of that it doesn't make sense uh, for Ghana to have its oil, to have its gas, and not take advantage of that when the people of Ghana, a vast majority of them, um, are living in, in energy poverty. So that just gives you that sort of very str um, strong link, as I mentioned, between um, the resources, the climate impacts, but also the development imperative. And, and here I wanted to just basically show how South Africa is a typical example of this just transition problem uh, because of its heavy dependence on coal um, and the fact that, you know, even as that we saw for a bit at least, uh, a, a very short period, a decline in demand, um, but then there was this sort of um, rebound, if you like, and, and now coal is as big as oil and gas. Um, but the South African situation shows that even in the rich um, areas, the rich provinces which, where you have coal, you still have very high indicators of poverty. So those, those things haven't gone. And, and I think for me, there's, here's the dilemma. The dilemma is um, increased exploration, more mining, more gas pipes and all of that that many countries in Africa are busy with, in as much as it's about their, their development alternative that they want to exercise, 
it hasn't actually satisfied energy security. Right? So the aspect of energy, energy insecurity, I should say, the aspect of energy insecurity is still there. Even as these gas pipes, these oil pipes are being found and being designed, and being developed, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we need to sort of pay attention um, to those things. I want to talk to you a little bit about this, and I think I would want to pause after this. Um, just to say that there is this initiative um, that we're doing um, as part of the Prince Klaus um, chair, but also just basically to, with University of Utrecht and Yost is, is part of this. Um, and I've also talked to Martin about it. It's about basically creating a space where we are saying that the problem of just transition is because it's been too much of a niche concept. If we take it out of the niche and we invite people to add layers of their own definition in, it gets us to see ways in which we can address the problem. Because if you talk to a lot of people, they will tell you what just transition is, but can they actually show you, right? And so this conversation is about pointing to where the problem areas are in just transition and actually doing something about it. And that's what we want to try and do, is, is bringing those voices that we don't normally hear, uh, but also bringing examples of what an unjust transition would look like. And my organization has started documenting that. So we thought that this could be a kind, it could act as a space, but if we do it well, that space could then become some sort of a incubation point to see how other things could grow out of that, how projects can grow, how policies can be um, 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 illuminated. I know it's a big word, but how you could actually tell a policymaker something about just transition from the concrete examples that you have. Um, so that's just to say that this is happening. There's an event we're having on the 6th of November. I would like to invite, I, I hope I have the permission to invite people to the, to the event. Um, we're having a parallel event. It's happening in Ghana and in Utrecht. Um, so it would be good if you can come and add your voices um, to that um, attempt to widen the debate and bring more voices on board. Um, this presentation is already quite long. Uh, you've heard a lot about the, um, the, the problem related to um, this double impact that Africa faces. Um, I wanted to just highlight here that um, if these resources to some extent um, are not exploited, then there's a, there's a sense that some of the monies would be lost. Um, and we're looking at a huge amount of money. So, and this is why many of the policymakers are very keen to say, no, we have this right. We want to take advantage of it because it's now or never. Um, also, just to say that, um, as you can see, um, the, the story, the energy story, the energy landscape is basically showing that many countries in Africa are actually close to that discussion. There are a few countries that... Um, Thelma and I will be going to, to basically understand where they stand in the transition. And we've already been told by some of the officials that uh, some of the questions around um, green or net zero, we should try and avoid because it would not sit very well with some of the people that we're going to talk to. And that's because there's a very strong and almost an entrenched view that that sovereignty of natural resources is not something that they want to be denied of. That how you use your energy resources is part of your sovereignty. And therefore, you know, if you have a continent that has a, um, a ratio in terms of um, the reserve they have to production ratio of 40, 41 years, and now you want to tell them overnight that that has to be almost, you have to forego that, it's a very hard conversation, and many countries are not ready for this yet. And that's why you see it a little bit as that sort of um, climate colonialism to some extent, that you're now issuing some kind of a veiled embargo on their resources because you're telling them what they should do when you've had the privilege of hundreds of years of those very resources. So the power aspect is very, is very important. Um, how we catalyze the transition, I talk about scale, I talk about... Um, the need for how we can target some of the three sectors that I see, agriculture, energy, and cities. Um, and that's because we have 60% of African population are, are living in slums. Um, so that's a, that's a big problem. 
you can't have new markets, new investments without thinking about the whole aspect of de-risking. Um, so de-risking is a very important concept beyond the concept. It needs to be done. Um, and so that's also what is holding the debate. I also mentioned this, the, 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 the Namibian story. The only reason I wanted to bring this as part of the conversation is because when you find hydrogen in Namibia and when if an EU says, OK, we don't have these resources, we need it, and then they have to outsource um, hydrogen to Namibia, and Namibia has to um, provide um, hydrogen to the EU, then it has to be in Namibian terms as well. If they borrow a lot of the money, then who owns the resources? You know, so, so those are issues about ownership and how do we get away from you know, the, the equity issue where you give so much money that, that, that those resources um, it, are not ones that you can actually make a claim on. You know, so the Namibian, Namibian government had to invest up to 24% equity stake. Um, and they're not able to raise all the monies. Um, and some of that money is going to come from the EU in terms of their partnership. So issues around ownership, around the, the financing structure are things that you have to bear in mind. Because that's what I meant by we don't want to reproduce some of the problems of the past, where you own it, but you don't control it. Um, so those things are, are fundamentally important. Um, I've talked to... That's yeah, yeah. Yeah, if, uh, for me it's difficult to see in what extent um, green hydrogen export can in any pathway fit in a just and sustainable transition for Africa. <laughs> Why do you say that? Yeah, because um, um, the production of hydrogen requires a lot of mm. water and it's uh, it's a water stressed area. Mm. Okay, you can use seawater, but then you need enormous amount of electricity. Well, why use that electricity for hydrogen to export it instead of uh, increasing um, yeah. access to energy through local residents? Yeah. So there are, uh, and then there are indeed also a lot of financing questions. Mm. Uh, so for me, the, the, the narrative from uh, the Germany in this case mainly because they invest in it, but from the north and global north I can understand that they probably uh, want to invest in it to get um, import of uh, mm. hydrogen, but for me it's very difficult to see how that would fit with a sustainable yeah. transition yeah. in Namibia. Yeah, no I think you're right, the, the jury is still out on the hydrogen issue, it's the issue around transport, how do you transport it? Um, on these issues around the equity side of things, you know, countries who have it may not necessarily have the resources to fully take advantage of it. And those resources are coming from elsewhere. So it compromises their ownership and that sort of ownership structure. Um, so I think, yes, there's a... Uh, but, but that's what I mean by also that the narrative is not being controlled by the countries in the global south. Because if countries in global south control the narrative, then they will be able to kind of tell the story that you're telling and basically say, where does this sit? What's the logic of it? What's the sense of it? You know, how do we counter this narrative by providing another alternative? But right now, many countries are basically following the narrative. It's renewable energy, it's hydrogen, it's other sources of energy. And we are basically following those, um, those very... Um, Na um, those narratives that are already been set. Um, so, so here I was just basically saying that the, 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 the critical minerals, as I mentioned, I didn't have this figure, but you, they, they're so essential. But the critical minerals still means that you have to have a governance framework in place. And as I said before, they're not, they're not new. It's not new. Africa has always had these critical minerals. But you, we need to find a way of how you can uh, get some profit out of it in a way that benefits the whole of the people of Africa. So that it's, those, it's not just an enclave thing where it goes into the pocket of somebody. Um, so, so these things are all there, but, then, but we still have to draw lessons from the past. If we don't, then we're going to be reproducing other forms of injustice. Uh, and I think it's important. But then again, to the point that you made, I think for me, the point that really worries me about some of these new resources 
So who is it for? You know, who is it for? That preposition for, I think, matters a great deal. Because if I'm exporting a resource that I don't have to the complete exclusion of the people within that country where I am, they, there's, there's no sense in that. There's no logic in that. So, and, and that's some of the perverse aspects of the market, that you can follow the market so much that you don't do justice you know, to ma things that matter. Because people do want to have a quality of life. And energy in any part of Africa is a barometer for social development, for economic development. So if you deny people of energy, you're stopping enterprising, enterprises from functioning, you're preventing people from having decent jobs, you are basically stunting the economy. You know? And, and, and it, it, it matters that Namibia and other countries that have these resources are not just thinking about how the resources could find its way to Germany or other parts of the, 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 the Western world that it's important that they also say there are corridors of poverty in our countries. Energy poverty, real poverty. How do we fill those gaps? Yeah, I could have understand if the government of Namibia would have signed a contract with Germany to, to discuss or to, to, to organize how you produce green steel with hydrogen mm. in Namibia and um, probably also produce um, the the, the, the materials that are needed is either cars or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, and so attracting then the green industry, um, but it seems that the, the government from Namibia entered very quickly into mm. uh, a deal with, in this case, Germany yeah. to, to export um, it without, yeah, yeah, I think really thinking about, okay, how can we benefit as a country? Uh, and how can our people benefit from it? Yeah. We just had a discussion like five minutes ago about like fossil fuel exports and about like the loss of revenue. So I mean, to a certain extent, I, I can see the, 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 like, the, the, the issue here, the very real issue of like where the energy is going to end up, but there's also like a certain type of logic in it, like replacing one export with another, and then the question is like, how do you do that and how do you make sure that's fair? Mm. Yeah, but it, it seems to be a bit uh, unthoughtful uh, to enter to, to enter in the same um, the the old faults instead of creating a new opportunity. That is my uh, what I'm amazed about. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So. Um, this is still about hydrogen and just still about that conversation that yes, there is a tendency that Africa could become a hydrogen exporter, but I think that some of what you're saying are still there. These are things that we need to sort of look at. I mean, I'm basically saying that you can't be just a conveyor belt of, of transferring all these raw materials. And that has been the problem for a long time. You need to find ways of adding value. And that's why that local entrepreneurship, that innovation, creating industries within, you know, uh, matter. Because otherwise you would just be salting away profit to others and ignoring um, real dire issues of poverty. Um, this is the core of the, the debate. Um, there's no way... I mean, I despair when I go to the, the COP meetings. There's no way you can walk towards, run towards, whatever word you want to use, a transition without climate finance. You know, you can't do it. You need investment. Um, and, and, and those investments cannot, the, 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 the vast majority of countries in Africa do not have those investments lying somewhere. You know, that, and that's where that solidarity aspect comes in. You need to be able to find the monies and the international financial institutions, the international architecture itself, need to find a way of supporting countries that have a high ambition towards their renewable potential to help them develop that so they have a higher penetration of renewable. And if that doesn't happen, then it becomes really just a pipe dream. But for, for now, we talk about these things um, without talking about the climate finance. Um, there, there, there's one, there, there's a one, um, one. Um, it, it's not, it's not an anecdote, but it's just a very sort of quick um, segue I wanted to use because 
there, there is a gentleman that <laughs> was cited, um, uh, somebody who's uh, actually quite well known, but cited to say that with the event, what's happened in Ukraine, what we've seen is when Africa was basically saying that na natural gas is a, is a clean fuel and it could be a transitional you know, fuel, it could be a bridge, that was basically um, dismissed. When the, when the war broke in Ukraine, a um, few months later, the EU was basically looking for sources, identifying sources of where they would have stable um, gas um, to be able to um, import that into the EU. Um, and meanwhile, if you think about, um, and the EU actually gave Mozambique, um, I, I don't have my notes, but I think it's um, quite a significant amount of monies um, to fight a northern insurgency in Mozambique where the gas pipelines sit to ensure that those resources are not going to be you know, laid hands on by that insurgency so that they could fight that. But at the same time, where was that money when climate finance was being talked about? You know, so, so these are some of the contradictions in the discussion around climate finance. You know, there, there is a sense that there was the countries in the, in the West were very quick to start identifying where they could have a stable supply of these resources, even as they were talking about emissions reductions. And even as they were condemning the fact that natural gas is not all the, altogether clean, you know, there, there could be issues around security. Um, but at the same time, we're now looking to secure that in countries that are actually considered to be somewhat fragile. Um, so, so these, these I think, are, are some of the things that I mentioned, uh, what, what, I, what I meant about breaking from the past. So that that sense of, um, uh, you know, I think the word um, is predation, that, 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 that sort of predatory tendency is something that we can do away with. Um, uh, let me end with this, that um, I think there's a recognition in Africa that this problem is big. There's a recognition in Africa that Africa can't just build its own sort of siloed world, you know, a wall around itself. It has to trade, historically it's always traded with um, the EU countries. Um, and there's a lot that can be gained from that still. Um, and there's a recognition that, you know, th this is a continent that can actually become part of that fight and support it in ways that could show the rest of the world what it, what it needs to do. But there is also a sense that that preparedness has to happen. Um, that, that an energy transition in a way, if, if you look at the landscape as it is today, is not just dependent on one country. Africa's energy choices are not independent energy choices. Right, so what they do has implications for the rest of the world. So, so th this was a quote I wanted to share to say that uh, because this transition is not just dependent on Africa, um, the continent is not in charge of it, but it's still prudent to prepare for it. And it wasn't something I said, it was something a, um, a government official said from Ghana. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>